Hello, good morning, and Sitaram to all our listeners in Trinidad and Tobago and worldwide, and all those people who join us on the various platforms. I say very good morning to you and welcome to the program Addiction and Recovery. This program is interactive, and of course, if you have questions, concerns, you can call the numbers on the screen 663 2335, 663 1027. And uh, they will patch you into the program and I will respond so far as is possible. I also want to let all our listeners know that this program is again repeated on radio and TV Jagriti at 10 p.m. tonight. And it will also, it is being recorded and it will be posted on Facebook and YouTube uh, soon after the program is completed. So those of you who wish to send a link to someone who you think might benefit from the program or you'd like to go back and listen to it. And of course, you can make your comments on those platforms and on YouTube and uh, Facebook. You can make your comments and I'll respond to them. So this morning, I'm going to be talking a little bit about a very troublesome issue. One that a lot of people who have not used drugs uh, may have a difficulty to really come to terms with. And it usually leads to a lot of rejection, stigma, disgust, and that is withdrawal symptoms. For anyone who has been using any psychotropic drug, when I say psychotropic, I mean drugs that can change your mood, can alter your, 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 your disposition at the time, you know, give you a high or or that people use to help them to cope with depression, anxiety, and so on. Mood-altering substances, usually prescribed by a psychiatrist. Most of these, when they are wearing away from the body, when they are leaving the body, they result in withdrawal. Withdrawal symptoms may not only be physical, they can also be psychological. And I know a lot of people get their inf information and have formed their opinions and judgment from looking at the movies, you know, you would see heroin addicts who are shaking violently and going berserk, and you form an impression from that. And um, as a result, a lot of people are fearful, you know, of having to deal with these conditions. And as a result, they are afraid to stop using the drugs. But let me say at the outset here, I have worked in the field of psychiatry, have done a lot of research in this area, and strange enough, much to the dismay of a lot of people out there, it is not the, the illicit drugs that cause severe withdrawal symptoms. Generally, the heroin and the cocaine and the marijuana and all of these do not cause severe withdrawal symptoms. And one, it is easier for a person to give up on all of these other illicit drugs. However, the drugs that give the most trouble are those that are legal. Alcohol is one of them. It is very difficult, has more withdrawal symptoms than any one of the other drugs. And especially those prescription drugs like the barbiturates, the benzodiazepines, and the anti-anxiolytics, the sleeping pills, those when you have become habituated and dependent on them, it is very difficult. To, 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 the withdrawal symptoms are much more severe. So I want to talk about that because this week I saw quite a number of people who had problems, who had been had problems because of some situation in their life that they were going through at the time. And one of the first uh, symptoms that a lot of people suffer is insomnia. You know, whether it be physical uh, uh, accident or, or pain and all of that, or psychological trauma, like the loss of a loved one, or separation, divorce, financial problems. You know, there's a lot of uh, one, guilt feelings, uh, all of those things, conflict that is unresolved with, with uh, relatives and so on. All of these can impact the mind and cause a person to have problems to sleep because you know generally during the day 
we can distract ourselves with a lot of what we are doing. But at night when we go to, when we go to our bed, that's the time all these thoughts come up. You know, we, we, we go chasing, our mind go chasing for solutions to how to solve this problem, how to meet the mortgage, how to deal with the unemployment, how to deal with a problem of one of the children or the siblings or the parents, you know, all of these things. And that's what will keep us awake. And uh, if it is stressful, we, our bodies tend to secrete adrenaline, which is even stronger than co caffeine. And this could keep us awake. And of course, the net result is we suffer, start suffering with what is called insomnia. And then after one or two nights, once you have not been sleeping well, your immune system becomes compromised. And then any little virus going around, bacteria, all of that, that has been there and dormant can give, you know, express itself and, and result in some kind of illness. And so we present ourselves to a our family doctor and so on. We explain to them what has happened and and, and, and one of the most important questions, most practitioners, including myself, would ask you is, how are you sleeping these days? And once you, you say, look, I haven't been sleeping for a few days, you get prescribed sedatives. And these sedatives, these innocent looking little tablets are very, very powerful, especially for a person who has not been on sedatives before. Now, alcoholics have a, a higher tolerance level for sedatives because alcohol is a sedative. And if you've been drinking for a long time, you become what I call hard headed. So that normal two milligrams of a sedative will probably not do anything to you and, or help you to sleep. And of course, the person who's been drinking, he would have learned from years of experience that if he has no problem sleep, all he has to go, go take a few drinks and he goes to sleep. And so he has, and that is what leads to dependence when you are suffering with insomnia and you seek uh, to treat yourself, to self-medicate, we say. However, the person who has not been using alcohol and goes to the doctor that's prescribed these little sleeping pills. And these little pills, you know, sent as they look, they're very potent. So for a first time user, two milligrams and they knock you out, sometime for days. You know, you sleep all night and still want to sleep during the day. And sleep, I, I want to speak a little bit about sleep as well, because sleep is a, a function of giving the body rest. Now, when we were little children, babies and so on, we would probably sleep for 23 hours at birth and just wake up to be fed and go back to sleep because the body is growing. But as we grow older, we don't need as much sleep. At my age, probably four or five hours and I'd be okay because I'm not very active and people like me. But a lot of people don't know that. And so they still think that they're not working and it's a holiday and they should be able to sleep all day and sleep all night as well. And um, so they have an unrealistic expectation. And when they can't sleep, they go to the doctor. Or, and a lot of people are not going to the doctor. Actually, three people I spoke to this week, they all had learned the habit from their, 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 their parents. Their family members were using these sleeping pills. They had it in the, in the, in the medicine cabinet all the time. And they will... They will prescribe for each other, you know, a friend, you're not sleeping, all right, I'll give, I'll, I'll give you something to help you to sleep. And this has developed into a culture in some families and in some circles. And, and you can become dependent on this in a matter of days. So it is a dangerous thing for people to self-medicate using what should be medication that is prescribed by a, by, by a, a professional. And then even those who are, uh, uh, go to see the doctor and are prescribed this, and they are told, I know doctors tell them, look, I, I only putting you on this for a few days, you know, because you can become dependent on, on this uh, pills. But Trinidadians are, are, are they, they're so smart 
They're too smart for their own good. They read the name of the tablet and they go to the pharmacy when it's finished so they don't have to pay the doctor and they bite under the counter. And I, 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 I'm sorry to say that a lot of pharmacies that should be acting more responsibly, most of them do, but some of them, they operate like a, a, like a, a grocery store. You know, it's just business and they sell it on the side. And this is something that needs to be regulated. And so these people continue to buy it and they have it there. And in a little while, they start becoming dependent. And once you start using these pills, at first you might have taken two milligrams and it would have put you to sleep. But just like alcohol, just like any other psychotropic drug, once you continue to use it, you develop tolerance. So after a little while, two milligrams is not going to help you. To sleep, you'll have to take maybe five. And these come, they don't come in, 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 in little, you know, that you, you have control over how they are produced. They are produced in maybe five, 10, 20, 50 milligrams and so on. And so, and I know a lot of people who now they say, okay, I cut it into four pieces and they're doing all kinds of crazy things with, 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 with the medication. And remember, these medications were tested in a particular way in a, on, a, on, on, on a certain selected group of people who probably are not using other drugs. And so that a lot of people are putting themselves at risk, especially those who are drinking alcohol, in addition to using sleeping pills. Because... Alcohol is a sedative, and um, nobody regulates how much alcohol a person takes when they go in the bar. They just, depending on the regulation, sometimes depends on their friends. You know, you, you went to just take a beer or two, and then your friends say, boy, you can't stand up on one foot. They buy an next beer and an next beer, and, 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 and sometimes you switch to harder stuff so that there's no regulation on how much alcohol you'll take. And then you come home and you take a sleeping pill as well with that. And there have been instances where people have overdosed on these psychotropic drugs. And you're not only putting your, your head or your brain to sleep, you're putting your heart to sleep and so you don't ever get a bath. And people, and, and people have died as a result of this. So coming back to withdrawal symptoms, I want to speak a little bit about that because it is important that anyone who has been using, whether it is legal or illegal drugs that alter the mood. And when I say psychotropic drugs, I mean alcohol, marijuana, cocaine. And alcohol is not only rum. A lot of people just still think alcohol is only rum, but alcohol is found in beer, in wine, in whiskey, and even in those local brews that people make, you know, for Christmas and all of that. They have alcohol, like the, 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 um, the wines that they make from cherry and, and fruits. So alcohol in any form is going to, is still alcohol and it, and it affects the liver just like the ones you buy in the shop. So as I was saying earlier, it is very, it is not difficult, it is simple to stop using drugs, but some drugs, the withdrawal is a little more difficult. Now, let me say generally, all the, the drugs that are stimulants, that like cocaine and amphetamines and all of those, even heroin, these, it is easier to come off these illicit drugs because they do not produce severe withdrawal. Heroin, unlike what we have seen in the movies, can produce the jitters and flu-like symptoms for a few days. And it, it is advisable if you're going to stop using it that you, you don't be by yourself, you know. And, and the reason of having someone else with you is not so much because you are going to be in danger because you stop using the drug. But it is really most of the time to help you, to keep you from going back and buy the drug. Because yes, the, the, the withdrawal some symptoms can cause a lot of craving and sometimes the individual by themselves is a, does not have the level of discipline and, and restraint to prevent themselves from wanting to go back and buy the drug. But 
they can stop and have, and a lot of people have been able, as we say, cold turkey, to stop using cocaine, marijuana, heroin, methadone, all of those. The ones that are diff more difficult is the alcohol and the sleeping pills and all of those. So I will, I, I will just briefly let you know that, you know, what are withdrawal symptoms? These are symptoms that occur when the drugs leave the body. Some drugs have a set pattern of withdrawal symptoms that occur in the body. Other drugs like cocaine, amphetamines, which are said not to have any physical withdrawal symptoms, nevertheless have psychological symptoms that sometimes affect physical behavior. I'm reading from a book that is done by James and Joyce Bitzler and Celia Haddon. And it's a book that if you can put your hands on it, the title of it is Coming Off Drugs, How to Stop and Stay Stop, The Facts on Addiction from Alcohol to Heroin, Including When to Seek Help and How to Find It. Very useful book that I have used as a resource material from time to time. But I, I think we will stop there for the time being because I wanted, you know, when you make these programs too long, a lot of people don't like to follow long programs on YouTube and Facebook. So we'll stop, take a little break there and we'll come back in a few minutes and we'll, re, re, and we'll restart the conversation on withdrawal symptoms as it relates to drug addiction. So see you in a little bit.